this should work. So uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Kirsty Bolton to tell us about COVID testing policies at universities. Thank you, Kirsty. Thanks, Julia, and thanks for inviting me. And I'm really sorry I couldn't be there. It really wasn't my planned preparation to um, have COVID finally catch up with me. Um, but hopefully I can still offer something to the discussion. So I'm going to start with the acknowledgement. It's also the background of perhaps why I'm speaking about this. And my interest in COVID and university started with a VCAM study group on unlocking higher education spaces back in the summer of 2020. And I also got involved in expert advisory groups within um, my own university and some sort of oversight of their pilot asymptomatic testing, which led into um, a study um, to do some research around um, sort of full-blown asymptomatic, asymptomatic testing scheme within the university. And then alongside that, I've been part of a higher education working group um, with researchers from across the university and um, my thoughts rely on things I've learned from all the people listed on here and more, though um, this talk is really my own biased review and I'm really happy if anyone else with expertise wants to add to the discussion. Um, so I'm going to start off with, as, as suggested, um, with what makes universities different and why we want to make, but why we might want to consider asymptomatic testing there, regardless of what's going on in the rest of the community. And these are things I'm sure we could all think about the, the young demographics. Um, so there are um, in the year 2020 or 2020, 2021, there were 2.75 million students in the UK. And although most of them are young, there's almost 600,000 over 30 and over 3,000 over 70. And then we have a large number of academic staff and nearly as many non-academic staff who of course, generally aren't as young. So although the majority of people may not have age-related comorbidities, there's a sizable population who do. Um, many of the students live in halls of residence or other settings of congregate living where there's large households where transmission is perhaps not understood as well and it may be hard to isolate infected people. And um, all of these students and staff um, are spread across a couple of hundred providers, but there are very many, very large workplaces that, you know, tens of thousands of, of students and staff in one place, which aren't necessarily captured in other population level models of epidemic growth. And there's worry that they could spark community transmission. It's um, sort of important to understand what's going on there. Um, and then the list goes on. There's the migration worrying about all of the students, hundreds of thousands of students who come into the UK um, each year to study. And then this migration is repeated on, on smaller scales during the year with people coming and going at term times. There are large events where people might have lots of contacts, like exams and graduation. And because of the young demographic, um, behavior might be different in the general population. There are concerns that contract tracing could be difficult because people are unwilling to disclose information about their peers. Um, they may have different risk tolerance to, to sort of mixing in a pandemic and different levels of vaccine hesitancy. And, um, you know, even, early on we knew that there were, there were higher rates of asymptomatic people or perhaps people who are mildly symptomatic who are, who are younger um, who may not meet, meet the, the formal case definition which is always until till recently in the UK being fairly strict about the list of symptoms that would trigger symptomatic testing and of course universities are already known for freshest flu so that this fear that you know, even endemic respiratory infections can spread rapidly across the campus. So all of this put together for, for many people seem to provide a lot of motivation for doing asymptomatic testing in universities. Um, and of course, there are many different testing strategies that we could think about or that have been floated and some of them carried out the, the sort of regular voluntary testing, which I guess is sort of mass testing we're talking about, but also testing on arrival testing when you return home, test to access services, or we could think about targeted testing like surge testing homes of residents where there have been cases detected, contact testing, which wasn't always standard. In the UK, sentinel surveillance, perhaps in a low prevalence setting where um, you want to find out, you want to find the, the beginnings of the outbreaks or population surveillance like ONS and REACT where you're um, specifically sampling to estimate overall prevalence. Um, 
And then for each strategy, you've got to consider all the properties of the test, which I'll defer to what Tim and Tim spoke about earlier. But I guess universities were in a neat position that they had their own expertise and could develop their own tests. Um, and one thing that has been done in universities is, is the um, trial of different collections um, methods. So quite a few of the universities who have um, instigated testing schemes have, have used collection of saliva. Um, so we've talked a lot about PCR and, and lateral flow tests. There are a couple of universities who did use some lamp testing, which I understand the sensitivity can fall somewhere between PCR and lateral flow, depending on how the tests are run, but generally thought to be cheaper and faster, but um, don't seem to have taken off in any meaningful way. Um, and because many of the universities opted for PCR tests, which are expensive. Um, there's, there's also discussions of, of how, um, how do we pull these? Obviously, if you pull samples, then if you pull a positive test within negative samples, then you're gonna lose sensitivity. And here's just um, one plot from a paper um, validating a pooling test that was used in schools and universities showing how the CT values increase with pool size. Um, but some universities, um, in Cambridge University used epidemiological considerations to maximize sensitivity um, or utility. So for example, if you pool by households and in the situation where household contacts still need to isolate, then it doesn't matter um, so much that it takes extra time to do follow-up testing and, and find out who's positive <clears throat> and in fact, the, another study suggested that pooling by household is actually more efficient because the follow-up testing is clustered. Um, if, you, if you believe that the household contacts are the most um, are the most risky, um, the others are, um, have argued for a sort of random pooling because it's logistically easier. And in some techniques, like a two-way matrix pooling, if prevalence is low enough, then you don't need to retest samples to find out who is positive. I guess um, the calculus is all, all of this has changed with new variants and, and changing rules as well. Um, and I suspect that, you know, follow-up testing after pool um, in pooling would be sort of sort of, of, of limited value in this sort of daily contact testing scenarios that um, we might be more focusing on now, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, so of course, trying to understand how to do um, asymptomatic testing in universities or what effect it might have or how to use limited testing resources is a problem that's ripe for doing modeling. But there's just large amounts of uncertainty in what um, the models could and how models um, could predict what would happen if you did asymptomatic testing. So just a couple of examples of the uncertain parameters. And this is from a paper by Brooks Pollock et al. showing how um, different interventions rank as the asymptomatic infectiousness increases and it suggested that mass testing was, was the most effective strategy when asymptomatic people were similarly infectious to symptomatic people. And although we do know a lot more about um, the viral load profile of asymptomatic people, now um, go, going forward there seems to be continuous uncertainty in this due to effects of vaccines and new variants and how people behave with different sets of symptoms. And of course, uptake is the, the other main, one of the main uncertainties. And here's um, a plot from Hilladale, just showing how I'm just looking at this red bar here and here, how, um, it, oh, sorry, how um, the proportion of the population infected at one term at university changes if you have weekly testing for half of the population or 80% of the population. Um, but despite all of these uncertainties, um, some universities have gone ahead with asymptomatic testing and I'm just going to provide a brief timeline to um, put some context on some of the results that I'll show you next. So um, in the summer there were some testing pilots, in particular there was um, a pilot in the vet school at the University of Nottingham, it was on a rural campus where people were asked to provide a weekly PCR swab and also fortnightly serology tests. Uh, um, that was considered successful at the time. It was in a, a low prevalence setting there where um, 
There was perhaps one case detected right at the end of the study. Um, and then <clears throat> um, at the start of, oh, in the autumn term, there were several um, universities who started some testing programs of residential students. Um, and by October, November, as we've been hearing about, there was started, there were some pilots of um, LFD testing, and there was one of those um, conducted at Durham University where they, they looked, tested um, residential students and then outlawed it slowly to the rest of the university. And then we had this winter break testing, just following on for that, where um, there were government funded LFD tests that universities were asked to administer to students or they're offered um, the opportunity to administer them to students and offer them two LFD tests seven days apart. Um, to give them some confidence that they weren't infected when they were returning home to families for their winter break. Um, and then, of course, we ended up having the national lockdown, but in March 2020, there was some widening of face-to-face -face teaching and returning students were encouraged to test um, before returning, and some universities offered continual LFD testing before the, the community testing became widespread in April 2021. Um, and then in May, we had students returning to campus. Face-to-face um, -face teaching was resuming sort of almost as normal. And at this stage, um, there's a Nottingham testing participation pilot, which I'll speak a little bit more about, which um, was looking at how um, participation could be increased if you change the rules around isolation and socialising. Um, and then, of course, um, in April this year, the, the LFD test, free LFD testing has ended and universities are starting to close down their asymptomatic testing program. So it seems the window has, is closing on, on understanding um, how asymptomatic testing might work in these sort of semi-closed settings to maintain um, education, face-to-face -face teaching, et cetera, in, in the face of um, an epidemic or a pandemic. So I guess there are many ways and um, we heard a little bit about it in the last talk about how to evaluate tests. One is just, I guess, how students feel about it, how many people were prepared to do it, and was there a quality and uptake? And then um, did it have any effect on um, outbreaks? So I'll just draw you right to the red column, which is uptake. I'm just, um, just pulling out some of these um, time points that I was talking about. So in the initial vet, um, summer 2020 pilot study, there was very good uptake amongst these vet school students. So, you know, keeping in mind they do have a medical background and they may, um, you know, most of them were happy to be part of a research project. Um, and 70, over 70%, 70 sorry, it's very sensitive, um, provided all samples. So I guess that provided high hopes that um, that sort of uptake might continue. Um, but when this was rolled out more widely, um, uptake decreased really rapidly over, um, over a month or so, um, with targeting halls of residents, it decreased from 58% to around 5%. They're keeping in mind that it can be difficult to estimate uptake, and often you're assuming that um, everybody is actually present, um, whereas people may have travelled home and be studying remotely. Um, but in, in another university, and this was um, based on the testing program in Cambridge, they estimated that they were maintaining over 75% uptake. Um, so there's obviously wide variation in uptake that may be related to um, local prevalence. Um, but <clears throat> I'll come back to that later. And then the winter break testing, a study from Bristol University suggested only 10% had the required two tests. Um, um, and so at, at this stage, I think a lot of people were worried about declining uptake in university students. And um, even though these tests were becoming uh, more readily available, um, it was difficult to maintain uptake amongst students. So Nottingham University had permission or worked with DfE to um, undertake a testing participation pilot um, in which some halls of residence were enrolled 
and they were allowed to mix more freely. They didn't have to stay in their households provided they took two tests a week and they met some certain um, percentage of people within, within the hall of residence. Um, um, sort of take, taking these tests. And then they found that this could, in, this did increase participation um, radically really, although keeping in mind that the halls of residence were chosen so that um, students were fairly clean to take part in the study or, or, or it may not have been uh, very interesting in the first place. So they were found at least 88% 88, 88 were taking at least one test and this is not taking into account the um, the students who'd returned home and if you did then it would be um, even higher. So it suggests that there may be ways to um, change the motivation for testing um, by changing the consequences of, of testing positive. Um, so there's been a lot of qualitative work done about how people feel about testing and why they test and why they don't test and I'm sure somebody better qualified than me could do um, a great talk, put together a great talk on this. A lot of this within Nottingham has been led by Holly Blake and Kavita Vidar. Um, and they've found that um, it, indeed the isolation requirements for peers and household members are perceived to have deterred uptake of asymptomatic testing. And I saw this theme repeated in the evaluation from Durham um, where they, they noted quite distinct peer pressure from housemates not to get tested, although it could sometimes work in the other way that you'd have positive peer pressure, but there was a lot of pressure um, not to test because it has consequences for everybody in your household. Um, and interestingly, testing uptake also depends on mood. It was correlated with lower anxiety in one study, but you're more likely to test if you're worried about friends and family, which I guess makes sense, and more likely to test if you're satisfied with the communication about testing. And um, in the evaluation from Bristol and Cambridge, there were also significant differences in uptake per year of study course and ethnicity. So it just goes to show that there are lots of heterogeneities that we could be taking into account in modeling, some of which may be dynamic, oh, sorry, related to um, what's happening with um, prevalence and isolation rates um, and something that's still probably an open question how um, how it works um, when the rules are, are different again. Some of these studies are date from 2020 and 2021. Um, of course, it would be nice to be able to see what testing has done to outbreaks within universities and their communities, but I, I think this is quite difficult to do, although um, here I've taken an example from the US where they had also had lots of testing programs and were sometimes able to get um, really high uptake. Um, so there are people looking at their um, within university epidemic curves and saying, well, look, it peaked and we brought in more testing and we're able to bring the peak down. But the other, as others have noted, um, this was also possible in university without, without mass testing um, with the other NPIs that they were um, that, that, that were brought in at the same time. And just to illustrate how difficult this problem is, it's just a picture, a plot, sorry, from a paper that was done by the, the Higher Education Working Group showing how outbreak probability is well explained by the importations, it's, you know, um, but there is quite a lot of, um, it's not clear how um, that the outbreak potential is um, mitigated by initial testing or testing capacity. Um, and it's just an ad for something that I will be talking about next week, I think it's next week at the Juniper Center Seminar, where another way to look at this might be to look at um, the settings and behaviors associated with a positive asymptomatic test result. So we've looked at detailed contact data from participants of the university testing service and looked at their behavior in different settings over the week before they tested positive. And there is some indication that um, interactions in university settings like teaching and research were less risky um, for reasons that we can explain by the way people behave than interactions in other settings. So suggest there, there's definitely probably some role of all of these other things as well as testing in bringing university outbreaks under control. Um, so that there are also people who've tried to look at community level outcomes like in this study mortality 
Um, and I've argued that university, and in this case, some of the testing was also outrolled to some of the rest of the community, um, was sufficient to bring case numbers down low enough that they actually saw a reduction in mortality compared to what they would expect. I think there are probably lots of confounders that are difficult um, to correct for like all um, sort of the links between the university and the community and you know the demography of the community and the prevalence of nursing homes or care homes and things like that. And again, just um, an illustration of what um, the picture looks like in the UK if you try to look at the relationship between community cases and student cases, basically there's a very heterogeneous, heterogeneous, there's a very heterogeneous pattern um, in the size of the student outbreak and what happens in the surrounding community that, um, and they of course may not just be related to testing alone. Um, so perhaps a more promising way to explore this would be to look at the genomic epidemiology um, and in Cambridge they have where it had um, the, the university outbreak and community outbreak were well sampled enough to attempt to do this. And, and they suggest that the university and community outbreaks were largely distinct. Um, and this was also seen in um, outbreaks that were examined in a similar way in the US. Sorry, time's up, I'm, I'm to my last slide, <laughs> sorry. And, um, but I guess this has the same problem that we don't know what other mitigations were in place and how effective testing, how effective testing was on its own. So, um, so I think there are still lots of uncertainties to explore, and I've just highlighted one here about behaviour, which um, I thought there was going to be a talk on, but um, hopefully we do hear a bit more about what triggers voluntary decisions to test and what changes do people make in their behaviour. Um, it's still an open question that I'm hoping to explore with some of the university data, but um, again, it's going to be um, in a different period with different restrictions, and this is going to be changing all the time. So in summary, um, I've put that behaviour is possibly the largest uncertainty in the impact of testing as an in intervention, perhaps in, in a university setting anyway, and test capacity may not be the limits, biggest limitation of a testing programme. Um, communication, the nature of the access to the tests and the transparency results is important from the qualitative studies, um, but the effect of voluntary testing in the absence of other interventions is uncertain. Um, I also think, yeah, the optimal strategies for testing method, frequency, pooling, etc., are probably constantly changing with all um, changes in people's contacts and variants and vaccination, etc. So I guess it would be good to have simple principles for how this should be outrolled in the future, but I think universities have proved a useful test bed for epidemiological and behavioural research. And it's certainly been an interesting area to work in and I'm happy to take questions. Kirsty, thank you very much. Okay, we've got, we started a bit late, so we've got time for a few questions. Um, if you've got a question, I'll bring the microphone. Hello, uh, thank you very much, Sam Clifford, uh, LSHTM. Um, so to what extent do you think universities' capacities to change their teaching modes uh, will influence people's decision as to whether or not they uh, go and get tested? Because obviously there's missing out on the social aspect of being locked in your residence, but also not being able to complete a course for which you're paying thousands of pounds. Yeah, I think that was certainly another dynamic and something that sort of came up in the qualitative studies, like we're here to socialise, so why would I do something that, you know, restricts, potentially puts at risk my ability to socialise? Um, sorry, was that, I'm not sure if that was the question or, uh, I think. But also the capacity to change modes to online teaching or, or blended learning approaches. Um, sorry, and how, in relation to testing or or do you think well, I think students in general have a mixed opinions I guess like the rest of it about whether they prefer things online or in person um but I, I think what many universities have found is that um that uh it's it's difficult to to increase uh, the, the te having the face-to-face -face teaching itself may not be enough motivation to get people to test to offset the the contact patterns, but that the, the increased contact, but that's just my 
feeling on how that panned out. One more quick question. Uh, Kirsty, I'm not familiar with the VET student, uh, study. How many students took part? 10, 100? Uh, I think it was of order 100. So it was sort of all the first year intake, and then some of the older students participated as well. Okay, Kirsty, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.